Good afternoon to our participants joining us from Accra and other parts of Ghana, as well as participants joining us from Europe. Uh, good morning to participants joining us from the United States and other parts of North America. It's a pleasure to welcome each and every one of you uh, to this high profile conversation on the 2020 elections in Ghana. This event, as the two previous events, is being co-hosted by the National Endowment for Democracy, the International Republican Institute, and the National Democratic Institute, NDI. My name is Christopher Fomonio, and I'm the Senior Associate for Africa and Regional Director for Central and West Africa at the National Democratic Institute. And today it's a singular pleasure, indeed an honor, for me to introduce our moderator for the day, who is someone who really does not need uh, an introduction for this audience. Honorable Connie Newman is, uh, has had a long and very distinguished career uh, with the US government in public sector, as well as in private sector, uh, with many of those years focused on African issues, uh, both from the US perspective, but also including the years that she spent living on the continent. As some of you would remember, Honorable Newman, uh, later in her public career, was the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs uh, in the US Department of State. And before that, the Assistant Administrator for Africa with the US Agency for International Development. We of the Democracy Support Community are very fortunate that in her retirement, Honorable Connie Newman has accepted to be a senior member of the Board of Directors of the International Republican Institute and continues to show tremendous leadership in supporting our work, helping to strengthen and promote democracy worldwide and especially on the African continent. It's truly a pleasure for me to introduce to you and ask you to all join me in welcoming Connie Newman as our moderator for the day. Over to you, Connie. Yes, thank you, Chris, and uh, I owe you one. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, we have been looking forward to uh, spending uh, an hour of your time talking about a topic that is very important to the people of Ghana and the rest of the world. Uh, between October the 19th of this year, and the end of October, a joint assessment team of the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute met with a wide array of Ghanaian stakeholders, including representatives of the Electoral Commission, political parties, the security sector, civil society, and citizen observation groups to examine the pre-election environment heading into the presidential and parliamentary elections on December 7th. On the 2nd of November, IRI and NDI issued a report. In the next few minutes, I'm gonna just give you a few of the highlights from that report. We noted that the December election will be Ghana's eighth presidential and parliamentary election since the emergence of the Fourth Republic in 1992. While past elections have not been without their challenges, Ghana has a history of transparent and inclusive polls and peaceful transfer of power. Ghana's strong institutions, free and open political space and democratic track record lay the foundation for inclusive, transparent, and accountable elections. Throughout our assessment, Ghanaians expressed a fervent desire for the 2020 polls to meet high expectations that they have come to hold for their elections. Key among the challenges is the need for increased transparency 
and greater inclusion around the important electoral processes so that everyone feels included in the elections. The authorities must do everything they can to prevent the presence of vigilante groups. There must be efforts to deal with the negative impact of fake news, disinformation, hate speech, and inflammatory language. In addition, we indicated that the election stakeholders could do more to make elections more inclusive by encouraging more women to participate in the electoral process. The report makes 21 recommendations. I'm not gonna go through all of them. You can, you can look them up, but I am going to just give you an indication of uh, the topics that were in our recommendations and will be included in our discussion today. The state of the Electoral Commission's preparations, in particular, addressing the voter list and the transmission of results. From the point of view of citizen observers, there will be and there were discussions of their plans and their challenges and the important role the media plays in mitigating disinformation and hate speech. Now, now I want to just go through a little of the process before introducing this panel that we have. This event is being live streamed on Facebook Live on IRI's Facebook page. However, we will not be taking in questions from Facebook. Those wishing to submit a question may do so privately messaging the account called Q&A in the Zoom chat or raise their hands. Simple enough, but we just wanna be sure that you don't get hung up on Facebook Live hoping to get questions through that way. And I'll repeat this a little bit later. Now I would like to introduce the panel. We have uh, the good fortune of having outstanding panelists to talk with us today about the upcoming elections in Ghana. We're gonna have, each will have a, a number of questions that we will uh, pose. Uh, they will have an opportunity to speak to those questions and, and generally uh, their view about the upcoming election. And then we're going to have a portion of the time for those of you uh, in the audience uh, to ask questions. Uh, the first speaker and the first panelist, Dr. Bosman Asari. Dr. Bosman is the deputy chair. Uh, for corporate services at the Electoral Commission. He previously served as the head of the Department of Political Science at the University of Ghana. He is the author of several policy papers in the area of international politics and democracy in Ghana, and has teaching and research interests in the fields of comparative public policy, democratic, development, public policy analysis, human rights, international security, globalization, and forced migration. What an impressive array of topics um, which he could be questioned at any point. Uh, the next uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Albert Arhin. He's with the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers. Codeo, I'm going to say after this. He joined the Electoral Commission of Ghana in 1978 and served as a regional director in two regions of Ghana before being posted to Accra to serve as the director of elections in 1998. He gained international experience working for the Commonwealth as an elections consultant in Malawi. Lesotho and Nigeria. As a UN volunteer, he worked as a regional coordinator during the elections in East Timor and Sudan, two very tough jobs. He has also worked as an observer with the Carter Center 
in the 2017 Liberian presidential and parliamentary elections. He has also observed the 2019 Nigerian elections on behalf of Padeo and the 2017 Uganda elections on behalf of the Electoral Institute for Sustainable Democracy in Africa. He retired from the Electoral Commission of Ghana in 2012 and was appointed as the national coordinator of Padeo, the role he is currently in. The next speaker, Mr. Samson Ananini, host of Newsfile and Joy FM and Multi TV. He is the head, the head of Partners Law, a firm based in Accra. He hosts a Newsfile radio program at Multimedia Group Limited, Joy FM. In his capacity as a broadcast journalist, he also served as a BBC correspondent, reporting on a wide range of issues with a focus on human rights cases. He often contributed to discussions on governance in the national Ghanaian media. Recently, this is a great honor, he was named the 2019 Journalist of the Year at the 25th Ghana Journalist Association Awards. He holds a Master of Laws in Alternative Dispute Resolution with a practice focus on international commercial and investment arbitration. He is an associate of the Chartered Institute, London of Arbitrators. He has consulted for and delivered special papers for professional institutions and special organizations, including uh, the Judicial Service of Ghana, and the local chapter of Global Watchdog Ghana Integrity Initiative and Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, Ghana Center for Democratic Development. Recently, he was invited to serve on the board of the International Lawyers Assisting Workers Network. So now what we want to do, you can see uh, what a powerful uh, panel we have. Um, I'm going to, begin by asking each, each one uh, several questions and then um, have them talk about those and, and then I will, might interrupt them. I do that sometimes, I'm just warning you, I might interrupt you <laughs> to have you either move along or say more about a topic that you have presented. Uh, for uh, Mr. Asari, can you, can you, tell us <clears throat> about the state of the Electoral Commission's preparations for the polls. That's my first question. And, and let me just ask the second one at the same time so you can cover both topics. Um, during the voter registration and exhibition process, some stakeholders expressed concern about issues with the list. Are you confident that all of these issues have been addressed. We'd be interested in knowing what steps you have made to ensure that all stakeholders had confidence in the list. And Mr. Asari, can you, could you speak to us on those two uh, topics uh, for now? Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me begin with the first one regarding the preparations. Then we, we had a meeting with the parties to, uh, this morning. And uh, we also had a meeting with the African Union and the uh, and ECOWAS delegation, as well as a meeting with the, uh, the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, the UN Special Representative for Africa and the Special Representative for the ECOWAS region and the Sahel. And we made it very clear to them that the Electoral Commission currently as we speak we are almost 97% ready for the elections. We are 97% ready. Uh, and the implication is that as we speak now, the ballot papers for the presidential election, election, as well as the ballot paper for the parliamentary election, all of them are completed. And about 80% of them have already reached the various regions. Then secondly, 
the registers for the elections have all been printed for all the 38,622 polling stations around the country. All of them have been printed and they've been sent to all the 275 constituencies. Beyond that, because of COVID-19 safety measures, all the protective equipment we need have been dispatched to the regions, including people we are supposed to train to, to un undertake the exercise come December 7th, the training has also begun for them. So as we speak now, I can say without any hesitation that the Electoral Commission is fully ready for the December 7th election. Then regarding the second question, the exhibition exercise is fully embedded in our laws. We do registration. When we finish the registration, then we, we, we exhibit the register. And one of the important objectives of the exhibition is to be able to identify individuals who for one reason or the other, after the registration, their names will be missing. So indeed, during the exhibition exercise, we identify some individuals whose names were missing from the register. And the experts have what they call end of life. So we have to apply this end of life uh, technique on all the equipment that we use in registering them. So as we speak now, we've been able to identify all the individuals who were missing during the exhibition. So currently the register has a total number of 17 million and 29,000. So when we did all, we were only unable to identify 541 individuals. Only 541 individuals were not identified in the system. But based on our checks, we, we have what we call the end of day report. The end of day report is basically after the, the registration for a day, when we finish the registration at a particular polling station, we compare that to what is in our data system. And we realize that nationwide, we are missing 541 individuals. So for this 541 individuals, the commission has decided that we are going to send their names. We already have the names, the polling stations where they are supposed to vote at. We are going to send their names to all the polling stations so that in case they come there on election day to come and vote, because we have their names over there and their pictures, we'll use a manual process to verify them so that they can equally vote and take part in the elections. So, so as far as the names on the register, the names are concerned, I can say that all the names have been identified and all of them, if they come on December 7th, they will be able to vote and decide on who become uh, the president or who becomes uh, the member of parliament in their jurisdiction. Thank you Thank very you. much. I have one other question. Thank you. And I have one other question. Um, in past elections, the results, transmission and announcement actually served as a source of tension. How has the commission, how are you planning to handle the transmission of the results and, and the communication of the results to the wide community? Yeah, uh, thank you. You know, uh, when you look at the, 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 the CI, what the constitutional instrument regulating the elections, uh, which is CI 127, we've introduced another layer, which is called regional coalition officers. For the parliamentary elections, everything will end at the constituency. So after counting at the various polling stations, they will go to the constituency coalition center where it will be put together, then the one elected in that constituency uh, will, be, will, be, will, be, will be elected in that manner. And this is a purely manual process. The coalition process, the counting at the polling station is purely manual. And when they go to the constituency coalition center, that is also a manual process where the parties will have their agents there. Each party is supposed to have an agent for the presidential, an agent for the parliamentary. The EC officials, EC has, we have some IT experts who are also going to be at each constituency coalition center. For the presidential, what is going to happen is that after it has ended at the polling stations, they will all go to the constituency coalition center. 
where they are going to put together the results for the presidential. And when they finish, the constituency results will also be sent to the region. It will also be sent to the regional capital. So the job of the regional, so this time we have what we call regional coalition officer. Their job is to put together all the constituency results in their regions. So for example, Ashanti region has the highest number of constituencies at 47, followed by the greater Accra at uh, 34, the Eastern region at uh, 33, uh, followed by the central region in that order. So the regional coalition officers who also happen to be the regional directors of the electoral commission, their job in the specific regions is to be able to, to put the constituency results in their regions together for only the presidential election. Then beyond that, the process of collating all this is a purely manual process, which we will, we will use technology to assist by the usage of an Excel sheet to be able to support it. So this is purely a manual process where the parties are going to have their agents over there. Then when the regions finish the collation, putting together, then the regions will now be, be able to send the results in their regions for the presidential. So they will go by saying candidate of the new patriotic party, President Akufuado, this total number, candidate of the National Democratic Congress. So the regions are only going to give us the regional results. So at the end of the day, the chairperson of the electoral commission, who is the returning officer of the presidential election, her job is to collect the results from the 16 regions of our country. So from Ashanti, Eastern, Greater Accra, in that order then she will put the results together, then she will be in a position to declare the results for the presidential. But as I said, the parliamentary results will be declared at the constituency level by the returning officers of the specific constituencies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be some follow-up questions for you on that, but now uh, we'd like to hear about today, uh, 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 Mr. Albert Harvin. Uh, Cudeo has uh, employed observers to monitor the pre-election environment. Would you summarize for us what the findings have been uh, so far? And then what are your plans for observing now, on, and after election day? Are there any issues and challenges that you uh, will be watching for. Thank you very much and um, good afternoon to you all. Kodeo for the past two months, that is beginning from September, October, sent some observers, we call them long-term observers to the field. And these are the summary of the findings that we have gotten so far. Um, what we have now is that civic and voter education activities from the, for the two months were generally very low across the various constituencies. Civic and voter education activities were generally very low. We also saw or heard from our uh, observers that there continues to be generally low visibility of election support activities by the CSOs, particularly those aimed at peace promotion. Generally very low activity or visibility of election support activities. Then we also come to COVID-19 and its protocols. We also have on, 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 on the report that the protocols were not adhered to during some political party activities. These protocols were generally not adhered to. And uh, the report is also saying that the National Democratic Congress, NDC, and the New Patriotic Party remain the most visible political parties in the constituencies observed as far as political and campaign related activities are concerned. The other political parties are virtually non-existent in most of the constituencies that our people are observing. So these are the four, uh, the, the summary of the findings for the months of September and October. We are yet to come with that of uh, November. 
-hmm. With regards to what we are going to do during the observation, Kodio is going to have 4,000 election day observers and they will be stationed at a selected sample of polling stations from all the 275 constituencies in the 16 regions of the country. In addition, and similar to what we did in the last uh, 2016 election, Kodio will deploy 275 observers in all the constituency coalition centers to observe the coalition of declared results at the constituency level. Kodio is very much interested in enhancing the quality of election day observation, timely reporting of election results, and then tabulation, uh, results tabulation, yeah. Election results tabulation. We're going to help with timely reporting, election of election results, transparency, and the credibility of election outcomes. These are our, our, our main goals. Kodio is currently in its 20th year since its formation and will continue to provide independent assessment of various electoral processes with remarkable levels of professionalism and commitment. This is what Kodio intends doing for now. 4,000 election day observers, we would have done more. We would have covered more polling stations if we had more funding, but for now, we are going to have 4,000 election day observers. Some are going to be seated at the various polling stations and others will also be roaming. Within this 4,000, 1,500 of them are going to be used for the PVT, which is the, the, uh, the vote tabulation, power vote tabulation process that we started from the year 2008. So within the 4,000, this is what we intend doing. Yeah. Thank you very much. I was going to ask you about the parallel vote tabulation, and it sounds like you're planning to do it, so I don't need to ask you about it. There might be some follow-up questions people will have on your findings so far, but let me turn to the uh, third uh, participant in the um, panel, and then we're going to open up for uh, the participants generally to ask questions. Uh, Mr. Samson Anayanini. Uh, what is the role of the media uh, in the elections? Do you, do you really think that the media has played as constructive a role um, as it could, or is the media, some of the media, uh, responsible for some of the tensions in uh, Ghana? Uh, let, let me just stop with that question, and then I'll go back to a couple of other. Right. Okay. So uh, generally, the media um, has been playing its traditional role, um, but certainly because of the elections, there is there is a lot of focus, or if you like, the central focus of reporting and news activity and programming has been around the elections. Uh, we started by uh, following the various campaigns, the political party uh, representatives, the uh, standard bearers, the presidential candidates and uh, parliamentary candidates have been crisscrossing the country and the media has you know, kept the floodlight on them. Uh, following them almost everywhere they go and the messages that they give to the electorate. Uh, we follow the voter registration exercise and the attendance, you know, processes uh, up to the end of that process. And now, uh, clearly, uh, what the media has been doing is to is focus on educating um, about effective exercise of the right to vote. Uh, we are in a country where oftentimes when we vote, we have a lot of ballots that get spoiled because people are soiling them. Um, people are thumbprinting wrongly. So the media's role at this time, getting to the election, to election day, has been to give some education. Uh, the election law uh, regulation that uh, Dr. Bosman Sari referred to the media has been focusing a lot on that as well. 
uh, teaching people and educating people about the rules, the do's and don'ts uh, on election day, including the fact that the media uh, persons uh, are to be treated, uh, giving a certain special treatment at the polling stations where the voting will take place. Uh, the law requires that they should be treated just in the same way as security officers who will be there once you are accredited and um, the same way as the, the party uh, candidates and their agents will be treated. They also will be treated in a similar manner so they will be able to report unhindered. And so that's where we are now. But in the next few days to the elections, there's been a lot of training uh, that's going on by the media houses. Uh, training uh, sessions that have had, we have had the, the security, particularly the police, and the electoral commission officials themselves uh, meet with media um, persons, uh, journalists, giving them training about how to go about the coverage of the elections. And as um, uh, you may know, a good number of the media houses, including the media house I work for, Multimedia Joy FM, every election year, we are able to project the elections um, independently. We are able to project the elections and to tell who the winner will be because the Electoral Commission had, has often delayed uh, in uh, coming to the end or the conclusion of the, of the process. So there's a good number of the media houses that are preparing getting all the software and the needed training to be able to do this exercise independently, dispatch reporters to as many as the, uh, the polling stations as possible, but almost every constituency coalition center, media houses, particularly the major ones, will have reporters stationed there to also observe and monitor the process in a bit to be able to inform the public and work towards more particularly projecting the elections. Um, I will say that so far, the media has been largely responsible, largely responsible in making sure that it does not project tensions and that it is informing the people a lot more. Uh, because the major political parties launch or outdoor their manifestos, we have spent a lot of time and we are still doing that, uh, telling people about the, the, the policies, programs and plans that each of the parties intend to pursue when they are voted into power. So we have often uh, spent time on the manifestos. Um, at multimedia, for example, we do what is known as the manifesto tracker. So we take the manifestos and take the previous year manifesto and do a comparison. Ask ourselves how many of the policies and plans have been achieved or have been carried out and the next um, layer of promises that they are making, um, how are they, are they capable of uh, achieving the promises that they are making? And we do that uh, in, in concert with uh, civil society organizations, including Imani, for example, who have um, over the years been able to track the manifesto promises and so on. So I'll say that largely, uh, even though we are playing as media, our traditional roles, we are focused on the elections and ensuring that campaigning, uh, is, uh, uh, campaigning is done on issues and where people are, are, you know, as it were, going off, including the candidates and encouraging things that the law uh, prohibits, we hold them to it and uh, call them out as, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think now would be uh, a good time for us to open up for, for questions. It would be helpful if you had a specific person to whom you'd like to address the question, otherwise uh, just uh, address the question generally. And I'm gonna have some help here, right? On uh, managing this process because there's several ways in uh, which you can uh, ask questions. 
Uh, here's a question for <clears throat> Dr. Asari, I mean. Um, can you talk about what protocols are in place to ensure that people are not becoming infected with COVID-19 at the polls? Uh, what rules in regards to COVID-19 should political parties follow at rallies and have they been followed? Dr. Asari? Yes, I can hear you. Should I go ahead and respond? Okay, Regard, regarding political parties following safety protocols, that is above the mandate of the electoral commission. So we, we, don't, we don't go there at all. But regarding what the electoral commission must do or will do on December 7th to ensure Ghanaians are safe. You know, beginning, we are going to have the special voting on December 1st. So we'll start from there. Frankly, at each polling station, the commission is going to have six officials. Of the six officials, one is referred to as a COVID-19 ambassador, a COVID-19 ambassador. The job of the COVID-19 ambassador is that he or she must ensure that the queue is well organized and that people are staying at least one meter apart. Apart from that, we have provided a bucket with water in Ghana, we call it the Veronica bucket. It has water, we have soap, we have tissue papers around. All those who will join the queue, before you join the queue, you must wash your hands. And when you are in the queue too, there are hand sanitizers around for you to be able to apply them. So we have a COVID-19 ambassador. Apart from that, all voters are, are required to come to the polling stations having their face masks on. So in other words, if you don't have your face mask on, you will not be allowed at the voting center or at the polling station. So we have put that in place. So as you are in the queue, the sanitizers are there. The job of the COVID-19 ambassador is to ensure that if you are a ballot issuer, you are not going to use your bare hands. You are supposed to do it wearing the gloves provided by the commission. So we have a ballot issuer for the presidential election, another ballot issuer for the parliamentary. Then we have a verification officer. As soon as one person is verified, the, the verification equipment must be wiped off. You clean it to ensure that there is no problem. So these are the safety measures we have put in place. And we are also educating the public through the media, civil society, and we're also telling political parties to educate their members to understand this thing. So on election day, and even beyond that, let me also say that the threshold, the number of people who vote at each polling station, the commission has reduced it from 850 to 749. So no, no polling station will have more than 749 people going to vote over there. And the good, the good thing about this is that even almost 70% of our polling stations, almost 70% of them have registered voters up to about 500. That means some of them don't even have uh, even 250, 300. So about 70% of the uh, uh, polling stations have voters between let's say six to 500. So what that means is that we, we don't expect that people are going to be in the queues for so long. So these are the measures we have put in place. Thank you. Uh, Samson, the next question really is directed to you. The question from uh, Caroline is, how are stakeholders planning on dealing with misinformation and disinformation uh, during the election? Right, the, the media in Ghana um, is very cautious when it comes to dealing with information um, whose, whose source cannot be verified. And this is because uh, despite the fact that uh, the Chapter 5, the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, gives the media as a fundamental human right the power to practice, and uh, Chapter 12 of the Constitution also guarantees the freedom and independence of the media and there's no censorship among others. 
there are laws even though criminal libel has been repealed in 2001 there are laws that prohibit spreading false uh, misleading information with the potential to excite rioting or create what the law calls fear and alarm this is this is criminalized and so the traditional media especially the english media medium media is extremely cautious about this um, a lot of the fake news uh, if you like is generated on you know non-traditional you know media and finds its way into some of the traditional media um, so media owners editors and producers of programs are very very careful extremely cautious because of the potential of suffering the punishment the criminal punishment that comes with spreading or circulating false and misleading information i think this to some extent um, what it has done is to you know allow the media houses themselves to ensure sufficient self-regulation because if you do not do and you know you 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 infract the law then you are looking to get punished and the supreme court not too long ago had to punish not only the media hosts of programs who were found to have been errant in the manner in which they you know conducted themselves in a broadcast but to punish the media owners themselves the media owners themselves <coughs> sorry excuse me so um this has you know put people on the on the alert um we have become aware of course we have become aware of um you know uh, a farmhouse here in in ghana where uh worked by the cnn i mean a, a troll farmhouse where worked by the cnn in collaboration with uh, local journalists has located some you know uh, a russian troll uh, that's clearly you know um, is said to have been involved in the u.s elections uh, you know uh, the last elections to be around and has generated several sites uh, by which they you know seek to uh, propagate uh, false information and it is it is um, the 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 alert has been done in good time enough because it is suspected that uh, some of the uh, figures in the elections have decided uh, as it were to hire some of these operatives to do to generate this information and not too long ago uh, one such very bad and false information was generated and was it was detected and so the media is on the high alert and i suspect that we will do far better uh, in these elections than we have ever done thank you uh i now have a, a question for dr sorry you you mentioned the special elections that will start in on december the first could you talk a little bit about that what will be involved and who can vote and how they will vote that's a question from sarah yeah okay i was i was muted so i was trying to get back oh okay uh, um, for the special voting i think uh, my my friend uh, lawyer ayenini mentioned it the ci the ci 127 recognizes three categories of uh, uh, organizations, the media, those who work in the media, uh, election officials, people like myself and the temporary officials we are going to work with. 
then members of the security services or the security agencies. So the law allows these individuals to vote early. The reason is that this, the individuals who work in these organizations are going to play a critical role on December 7th. So as we speak now, we've so far registered the people, out of the people we registered, 109,000. 109,000 of them are taking part in the special voting, which is on December 1st, on a Tuesday, December 1st, on a Tuesday. And all of them are going to vote at the various constituencies, at the various constituencies. So that's 109,000 individuals. And based on our checks, this is the highest number we've had for special voting. So these individuals are going to vote on December 1st. So that after that voting, uh, a number of them will be deployed. I know the media in Accra will send people to all parts of the country. Uh, the security services will also send people to all parts of the country. And as election officials, some of us will be going to other regions, et cetera, to go and monitor uh, the process over there. So these are the people taking part in the special voting. And all the protocols regarding COVID-19, all of them are going to apply during the special voting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have a note from Mr. George Sarpong, the Executive Secretary of the National Media Commission, who's indicated that, and that's the media regulator, that the commission is deploying an app for media monitoring and incident reporting, which should address some of the issues of disinformation and, uh, and fake news. All right, let me move on. Uh, let's see, I have another question here. Um, uh, yeah, somebody, uh, the, there was a follow-up question on the COVID protocol, uh, a statement that uh, there was disregard of the protocols during the uh, mass registration. And they just want to know how, since you're still out in front of us here, <laughs> um, what assurances do you have that they will be observed in the actual, during the actual election? You, did you hear the question? Dr. Asari? Oh, you're muted. Yes, I'm, I'm back now. Okay. <laughs> I, I think uh, to say that the protocols were disregarded during the registration is not being, it's not being very uh, factual or being uh -huh. very truthful to the work of the commission. Uh -huh. Certainly, there were certain challenges uh, because of the, uh, this was a new register. So you had instances where people were rushing to be able to register. We had some challenges, but to say there was complete disregard, uh, I, do, I, I don't think many Ghanaians are going to uh, share that. But I, what we are saying is that elections is only one day. And we know voting is from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. We have people who, are, who have deliberately been appointed as COVID ambassadors. Apart from that, we have the presiding officers are also there. And the commission is also engaging in public education telling people that when you join the queue, make sure you are one meter, uh, one meter is separating you and the, the person in front of you and the person behind you. So all these are the scientific, the best practices measures the commission can adopt. That doesn't mean there will be no challenges somewhere, but practically and scientifically, uh, we've, we've had engagements with our health authorities, the Ghana Health Service. We, we also have the national COVID-19 team We've engaged them and they, they tell us, once you can do this thing, you should be okay. And the old news also lies on civil society, political parties, the media in general, to also be drumming home the point. We shouldn't forget that even many, the countries we refer to them as highly advanced, highly developed, they even have challenges with uh, some of this social distancing and uh, people putting on the mask. That doesn't mean we are, not, we are doing whatever is necessary and proper. And it's also good to put in perspective that although we had some challenges with the registration initially, after three days or so, we were able to put everything was on point. And we, need, we didn't have a situation whereby as a result of the registration, 
people contracted the virus. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for the three panelists and I wanted to start with uh, Albert and it has to do with uh, the peace pact. As far as you know, what are the uh, efforts uh, to sign a peace pact and, and what recommendations do you have uh, to uh, improve the prospects for peaceful and credible elections in December? And then what, if any, uh, do you expect the international community to do between now and elections and, and during and post elections? So we're, we want to kind of close out with an understanding of uh, the assurances that each party has that there will be a peaceful and credible election. Um, oh, yeah, you're good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, before the peace pact can even come into force, uh, Kodio has been making some observations during the two months that we sent our people to the field. And the observation is that uh, the police, the IGP, we have been appealing to the IGP to try to punish the wrongdoers, those who committed various atrocities during the registration and the exhibition. And we've been saying this because um, when wrongdoers are not punished and they are left off the hook, others also behave with impunity and they will always would want to do it again and again. So the appeal has always been to tell the IGP and his men that whoever does any wrong, in whichever way people offend by way of the rules of the game, they should be brought to book. If you are able to do these things, maybe there might not even be the need to sign a peace pact because people will be alarmed and they will be uh, put off because they would know the punishment that goes with it. But that notwithstanding, I think if a peace pact is signed, and that's, I believe it's going to be within the parties themselves, if they are able to come together, and this has happened before, uh, in their code of conduct, the parties themselves have put down certain measures, certain things that they themselves will have to do to make sure that there's peace and tranquility during the, the, the election process. So yes, it is a good thing, but I believe the parties themselves should be alert and discuss it among themselves and have it in their code of conduct that this is what we want to do. And so if any one of us goes contrary to the, 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 the accord that we sign, then of course uh, you have betrayed the course and you should be punished as, as such. So yes, a peace accord must be, must be uh, uh, done. Yesterday I saw on telly uh, the Peace Council going around and organizing football matches and other things. I think it was in the uh, central region. These are things that will actually promote the peace. But that notwithstanding, I think the other CSOs should also try in their own small ways to be able to preach peace, both among the youth, there should be uh, the chiefs also come in forward to be talking to their people to observe the peace. So I believe, um, I personally have a strong belief that we're going to have a very peaceful election. So that is what I have for, for, for the time being. Thank you. Uh, Samson? Um, the National Election Tax Force has identified over 4,000 hotspots uh, where there is a likelihood of violence uh, occurring, and not long ago we have seen some of these manifested in the Ododododio constituency. We have seen the two major parties clash. We have seen a um, uh, gun being fired in the in the crowd and and stones being thrown to to hurt people. And the National Peace Council, together with other stakeholders, managed to bring the two candidates together to pledge uh, to keep the peace and to also get their supporters uh, to follow uh, suit. Uh, the, we have had the situation in Asawase. It's not been that exciting. 
Um, of course, during the registration uh, process, we we discovered that some of these hotspots that have been identified, some uh, some uh, amount of violence uh, erupted in those places. Um, so it is important that uh, looking at the 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 tensed nature because of the registration process and the the various allegations that came up particularly from the opposition party uh, the electoral commission certainly has uh, tried to resolve these matters and has given the necessary assurances uh, but whilst it does so we still speaking to the political part political players you still have some of them you know sounding uh, some of these issues uh, over and again. So it will be important uh, that the processes that led to the two previous or the very recent two previous elections, uh, the presidential candidates more particularly pledging to peace and to accept the results, if it were activated again, it will be important. But this time round, that has not happened. And as I understand, because of the vigilance of the people and particularly of the media, uh, Kodeo and the rest of them will be on the, on the field. They will be working with the media. The media will have the results in real time and will be able to tabulate and project with, with, with a lot of accuracy. And so uh, when, when people lose, uh, they would they would know that the statistics would have spoken to the fact that they have in fact lost and the judicial service uh, is also doing what it does every election year uh, it's outdooring its elections uh, adjudication manual and if people are educated a lot about the fact that when things don't go right there is an opportunity to ventilate and the place to do so is recourse to the court and not to you know firearms and and uh, any destruction i believe that once again uh, for as long as the media you know throws the floodlight on the elections um people will have no will have no uh, recourse um or they will have no option than to come to a point of acceptance of if the results uh, are not, as it were, uh, tampered with. Thank you. Thank you, all three panelists, for your outstanding presentations and the transparency of your answers. Uh, it's really been appreciated. And I'm now going to turn the podium over to uh, Dave Peterson. Thank you uh, very much, Connie. And uh, thank you uh, to all of our uh, uh, great uh, panelists, um, Albert uh, Arhan, uh, Samson Anyanini, and uh, Basma Nasare. Uh, you know, thank you to um, uh, IRI and NDI, uh, you know, the wonderful staff there, Mike and Maria and everybody. Uh, it's always uh, just a, a pleasure to uh, work with you and, uh, you know, for the endowment uh, to be associated uh, with this great work. Uh, you know, I've uh, had the uh, privilege to uh, observe uh, Ghana's uh, last elections. And uh, to this day, I uh, hold Ghana as the gold standard uh, for elections in Africa. And I must say after uh, today's panel, I'm inclined to uh, think of Ghana as being the gold standard for uh, elections internationally. Um, of course, <laughs> Uh, I am uh, loath to uh, hold anybody up to such a, a very high standard because we know we can't take uh, democracy for granted. Uh, yeah. There are always challenges, uh, things can go wrong. Uh, but, uh, you know, I uh, dare say that um, after having uh, uh, heard uh, today's speakers that uh, these elections uh, are uh, certainly going to be closely watched around uh, the world. Uh, we know that um, in recent uh, weeks that uh, we've uh, met with some disappointment uh, in uh, democratic elections. Uh, 
you know, I, I hate to say uh, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Tanzania uh, have been a bit disappointing, uh, but uh, I am uh, hopeful we're counting on Ghana uh, to um, reverse uh, that trend. Uh, there are more elections to come, uh, but um, I uh, do uh, encourage uh, you and your uh, efforts uh, we uh, at the endowment and the Ned family, uh, you know, we're uh, certainly uh, very uh, focused on, uh, you know, your efforts, um, you know, uh, we will uh, be, uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, working with you uh, after the elections and, uh, you know, to strengthen democracy uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, just, uh, you know, congratulations for your efforts thus far. And, uh, you know, we will uh, look forward to uh, successful elections in December. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I don't know if anyone has to say anything else or we say, all the best and everyone uh, be safe.